the modern Bibles are supposedly the result of modern archaeology and modern scholarship and modern discovery. I mean, even the people who promote these modern Bibles will tell you, well, the modern publishers just have more resources available to them today. They just have manuscripts that just weren't available to the King James translators. That's why the modern Bibles are better, they'll say. And the reason they say that is because the manuscripts that the modern Bibles are translated from, the NIV, etc., are newer discoveries, meaning that they were buried for centuries. Now let me ask you something. Do you believe that the true Bible was buried for centuries? The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. What does the word them refer back to in that verse? Thou shalt preserve them. Preserve what? His words. He's promising he's going to preserve his words, right? How about NIV? The words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. O oh Lord, you will keep us safe and protect us from such people forever. Is that saying the same thing? <laughs> the King James Bible is based on what's called the majority text, or we call it uh, the, uh, the textus receptus. Now think of the term receive text, the text that we received from our fathers. When we look at the Bible versions that led up to the King James, Tyndale, Matthew, Coverdale, Great Bible, Bishop's Bible, Geneva Bible, they all line up with the King James. They all basically say the same thing as the King James. The King James Bible is the culmination of the Bibles that preceded it. Only in modern times, as a result of German scholarship, have uh, so-called scholars departed from the reading of the King James Bible in any language and gone to the reading of the Sinaiticus, Vaticanus texts, texts that were uh, found uh, in the Vatican Library and in Mount Sinai in a wastebasket. And those two manuscripts were put together in the middle 1800s and produced a, a, Greek, a new Greek Bible that had never existed before. And that new Greek Bible became the Nestle Allen's Greek New Testament. It became the, the Greek Bible that uh, if your preacher says the original Greek says, he's not going back to the original Greek. He's going back to a, a Greek manuscript that's a little over 100 years old. He's going back to a Greek manuscript that was created by two unbelievers and uh, that became the basis of the uh, American Standard Version, the New American Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, the, the Good News for Modern Man, the New International Version, all those translations. A lot of people wrongly believe that the King James Bible has changed over the years, that the 1769 edition that we use today is completely different from the 1611. But in reality, the only thing that changed in 1769 were spellings, capitalizations, punctuation, some typos that were corrected. The words did not change. The words that we have today in our King James Bible are the exact same words that were given us by the translators in 1611. The words haven't changed. The words have been preserved, and that's what God promised that he would preserve. Judah yet ruleth with God. NIV. Judah is unruly against God. Would you say that is saying the same thing? Judah is also unruly against God. It's not saying the same thing. Thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth, Genesis 27. That's one of the blessings. Your dwelling shall be away from earth's richness. Away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling. They're saying the opposite, folks. It's not the same. Proverbs 18. A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. What's that mean? If you want to have a lot of friends, then be friendly. NIV. A man of many companions may come to ruin. Are these saying the same thing? Am I missing something here? If you've got a lot of friends, you'll be ruined? <laughs> That's what it says. That's not at all correct. The Bible says in Matthew 7, that narrow is the way, straight is the gate, and narrow the way that leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. Revised Standard says the gate is narrow and the way is hard. Wait, is it hard to go to heaven or just not many do it? Chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Now, as you're looking at this verse, the part that's yellow bolded in the middle is the part that's missing out of the NIV. And the reason that's missing is because it's missing out of the Sinaitic manuscript. 
The other place that they take out, the other three verses on the uh, Trinity that they take out is the word Godhead. And in the Greek there, it's theos, or theotitos, or whatever, but it's still theo, T-H-E-O, that's the word God, mm -hmm. okay? They take that out, and it's not capitalized anymore, and it's divine nature. And all the New Age people teach that we all have a divine nature. Yes. Yes. And so we don't have the Godhead anymore being distinct from creation. We have this divine nature that's in all people. In the King James, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. Notice how the New English Bible renders this verse. It says the old order is gone and a new order has begun. So we see Elhanan slew the brother of Goliath. But look what the NIV says. Same verse. In another battle with the Philistines at Gob, Elhanan, the son of Jair Oregon, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath, the Gittite. Well, wait a minute, I thought David killed Goliath. But now the NIV is telling you David didn't kill Goliath. Uh, Elhanan killed Goliath. The King James told you he killed the brother of Goliath. I think very much of what we've heard about uh, the King James being difficult is something that has come from... Um, the advertisers telling us, you know, now you finally have a Bible that you can understand. And, um, oh. you know, we know that the Bible is spiritually discerned anyway. Let me give you some examples of um, some of the differences in the words in the new versions. King James would say, rose up to play. Okay, that's four syllables. Uh, the NIV would say, indulge in revelry. Okay, <laughs> so you have six syllables. Uh, King James told, Second Chronicles, um, NIV conscripted, okay, three syllables, and I don't even know what conscripted means, okay. Um, old, in Hebrews 8, 13 in the King James, obsolete in the NIV. Um, called, one syllable again, the NIV replaces uh, old, um, called with designated. So you have a four-syllable word that's kind of difficult. And, and I'll give you some other examples from the New King James. The New King James is even more difficult to read than the NIV. Now, let me give you some examples. King James is smell. Okay. New King James, savor. Okay. Um, King James, house. New King James, habitation. Two or three or four syllables. Um, King James, um, man. New King James, mortal. The new versions, they say, are easier to understand. I'm going to give you some things on the PowerPoint here, and I'm just going to run through them very quickly. You tell me if this looks easier to understand. John chapter 5, verse 2. It says in the NIV, surrounded by five covered colonnades. In the King, G King James, it says, having five porches. You tell me which is easier. Here's the next one. Ezekiel 8, 16. Between the portico and the altar. But the King James says, between the porch and the altar. Here's the next one. Psalm 122, 7. The NIV says citadels. King James says palaces. The next one is in Ezra 8, 36. It says to the royal satraps. The King James says under the king's lieutenants. But you all knew what satraps were, didn't you? Okay. Genesis 6, 4 says the Nephilim were on the earth. The King James says there were giants in the earth. Now they use the these and the thous, and there's a reason for that. And then we'll go on to another subject here. Uh, if a word starts with Y, it is plural, ye, your, etc., okay? If it starts with T, it is singular, and there's an important reason. Nobody in 1611 was walking down the street saying, how art thou today? They weren't using that. But the King James translators wisely chose to use the these and the thous because of the distinction. If I walk into a room and say, you come with me, does that mean one of you or all of you? You can't tell. But if you use thee and thou, you can tell. You can see in John chapter 3, very clearly, Jesus said to Nicodemus, Marvel not that I said unto thee, singular, ye must be born again. He changed it to plural. I'm telling you that everybody must be born again. That's a really important distinction. The law is you cannot get a copyright and therefore protect your work and therefore get more money unless you have 10% different from the original. They're basically rejecting thousands of Bibles in all different languages that are all saying the same thing. Instead, they're going to go with Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, just because they're supposedly older. Okay, but just because they're older doesn't mean that they're right. Well, I want to read to close out this thing a quote from the co-editor of the New American Standard Bible. His name is Frank Logsdon, and I'm going to give you several quotes here, and here it is. 
It says, when questions began to reach me pertaining to the New American Standard Version, at first I was quite offended. However, in attempting to answer, I began to sense that something was not right about the NASV. Now, this is the co-author of the NASV. Upon investigation, I wrote my very dear friend, Mr. Lockman, explaining that I was forced to renounce all attachment to the New American Standard Version. Frank Logsdon came to understand exactly what was going on. Now, I want to continue to give you his quote. I must, under God, renounce every attachment to the New American Standard. I'm afraid I'm in trouble with the Lord. We laid the groundwork. I wrote the format. I helped interview some of the translators. I sat with the translator. I wrote the preface. I'm in trouble. I can't refute these arguments. It's wrong. It's terribly wrong. It's frighteningly wrong. And what am I going to do about it? I can no longer ignore these criticisms I'm hearing, and I can't refute them. The product is grievous to my heart and helps to complicate matters in these already troublous times. The deletions are absolutely frightening. There are so many. Are we so naive that we do not suspect satanic deception in all of this? I don't want anything to do with it. The finest leaders that we have today haven't gone into it, the new version's use of a corrupted Greek text, just as I hadn't gone into it. That's how easily one can be deceived. I'm going to talk to him. He's talking about Dr. George Sweeting, who was then president of Moody Bible Institute, about these things. You can say the authorized version, the King James Version, is absolutely correct. How correct? 100% correct. If you must stand against everyone else, stand. And that was the testimony of Frank Logsdon until the day he died, and that was written in 1977. 